Do you know what the realm is? It's the thousand blades of Aegon's enemies. A story we agree to tell each other over and over till we forget that it's a lie. What's up ladies and gentlemen, welcome back for another A Song of Ice and Fire video. In this video, I will be showing you some of the disturbing scenes from the books that were left out of the Game of Thrones television show. Now, there are so many different ones to choose from, but I just ended up writing down some of the ones that really affected me the first time I read them. As we all know, there are some very dark scenes in Game of Thrones, but even the show left out some scenes from the books that could be seen as shocking or unsettling. So let me show you some of the scenes that stayed with me long after I read them. Now, in the Game of Thrones television show, we got to see an amazing fight between Brienne and Sandor Clegane. During the fight in the show, we did see Brienne get injured to some extent, but this is nothing in comparison to what happens to her in the books. The character Brienne ends up fighting in the books goes by the name of Biter, and we did see this character in the show during Jack and Agar's introduction. He was one of the three men that was locked up inside the cage. Now, much later in the books, Biter is traveling with a band of outlaws. Eventually, Brienne does run into him at the inn at the crossroads, and there just so happens to be several small kids staying at the inn. So naturally, Brienne wants to make sure nothing happens to them. And one of the outlaws is actually wearing Sandor Clegane's helmet, but Brienne ends up killing him. Now, we all know she can handle herself against almost anyone, but that doesn't happen when she fights Biter. When these characters fight, this is what it says happens. Biter crashed into her, shrieking. He fell on her like an avalanche of wet wool and milk-white flesh, lifting her off her feet and slamming her down into the ground. She landed in a puddle with a splash that sent water up her nose and into her eyes. All the air was driven out of her and her head snapped down against some half-buried stone with a crack. No, was all that she had time to say before he fell on top of her, his weight driving her deeper into the mud. One of his hands were in her hair, pulling her head back. The other groped for her throat. Oathkeeper was gone from her grasp. She had only her hands to fight him, but when she slammed a fist into his face, it was like punching a ball of wet white dough. He hissed at her, and she hit him again, 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 smashing the heel of her hand into his eye, but he did not seem to feel her blows. She clawed at his wrist, but his grip just grew tighter, though blood ran from the gouges where she scratched him. He was crushing her, smothering her. She pushed at his shoulders to get him off her, but he was heavy as a horse, impossible to move. When she tried to knee him in the groin, all she did was drive her knee into his belly. Biter ripped out a handful of her hair. My dagger. Brienne clutched at the thought, desperate. She worked her hand down between them, fingers squirming under his sour, suffocating flesh, searching until they finally found the hilt. Biter locked both his hands about her neck and began to slam her head against the ground. The lightning flashed again this time inside her skull. Yet somehow her fingers tightened and removed the dagger from the sheath. With him on top of her, she could not raise the blade to stab, so she drew it hard across his belly. Something warm and wet gushed between her fingers. Biter hissed again, louder than before, and let go of her throat just long enough to smash her in the face. She heard her bones crack, and the pain blinded her for an instant. When she tried to slash at him again, he grabbed the dagger from her fingers and slammed a knee down onto her forearm, breaking it. Then he seized her head again, and resumed trying to rip it off her shoulders. Brienne could hear dog barking, and men shouting all about her. In between the claps of thunder, she heard the clash of steel on steel. Sir Hyle, she thought. Sir Hyle had joined the fight, but all that seemed far away and unimportant. Her world was no larger than the hands at her throat and the face that loomed above her. The rain ran off his hood as he leaned in closer. His breath stank like cheese gone rotten. Brienne's chest was burning, and the storm was behind her eyes, blinding her. Bones ground against each other inside of her. Biter's mouth gaped open, impossibly wide. She saw his teeth, yellow and crooked, filed and sharpened into points. When they closed on the soft meat of her cheek, she hardly felt it. She could feel herself falling down into the dark. I cannot die yet, she told herself. There is something I still need to do. Biter's mouth tore free, full of blood and flesh. He spat, grinned, and sank his sharpened teeth into her flesh again. This time, he chewed and swallowed. He is eating me, she realized, but she had no strength left to fight him off any longer. She felt as if she were floating above herself, watching the horror as if it were happening to some other woman, to some stupid girl who thought she was a knight. It will be over soon, she told herself. Then it will not matter if he eats me. Biter threw back his head and opened his mouth again howling, and stuck his tongue out at her. 
It was sharply pointed, dripping blood longer than any tongue should be, sliding from his mouth, out and out and out, red and wet and glistening. It made a hideous sight, obscene. His tongue is a foot long, Brienne thought, just before the darkness took her. Why, it almost looks like a sword. As you can see, this was one of the most vicious fight scenes we have ever seen. This was so much more disturbing than the fight she had with Sandor Clegane in the show. Biter was actually eating her alive, and he would have easily finished her off, but someone does end up saving Brienne at the very end of that scene. Brienne was losing consciousness, therefore she wasn't exactly sure what she was looking at. You see, what happened was, Gendry actually saved her by shoving a sword through the back of his head, out the front of his mouth. Now, thankfully, Brienne did survive, but it will obviously take her a while to recover from some of the injuries. The next scene from the books I want to show you happens in King's Landing. This time it involves Cersei, Kyburn, and a character known as the Blue Bard. He never does show up in the Game of Thrones television show, but what happens to him in the books is very gruesome to say the least. One thing I found interesting was, even though we never got to really know this character, Blue Bard, this scene still had an effect on me. Once again, Cersei shows exactly how heartless she can be. Now, for those of you that don't know, Blue Bard is a singer who is in service of House Tyrell. All the young ladies seem to like him and the way he sings. He's actually one of the singers at Tommen and Marjorie's wedding. As you all know, Cersei does not like Marjorie at all. She wants to do any and everything she can to get her out of King's Landing. So, Cersei decides she wants to make it look like Marjorie has been sleeping around with other characters. Cersei wants the Blue Bard to admit and testify against Marjorie, claiming that he himself has slept with her, but he's not about to admit to something he has never done. Well, that was a big mistake, because Cersei isn't about to allow him to get off that easily. So, Cersei has Kyburn heard him in many different ways, until he does agree to go along with whatever she says about Marjorie. This is what happens in the scene. Even in the Black Cells, all they got from him were denials, prayers, and begs for mercy. Before long, blood was streaming down his chin from all his broken teeth, and he wet his dark blue breeches three times over. Yet still, the man continued to tell his lies. Is it possible we have the wrong singer? Cersei asked. All things are possible, your grace. Have no fear. The man will confess before the night is done. Down here in the dungeons, Kyburn wore rough spun wool and a blacksmith's leather apron. To the blue bard, he said, I am sorry if the guards were rough with you. Their courtesies are sadly lacking. His voice was kind. All we want from you is the truth. I've told you the truth, the singer sobbed. Iron shackles held him hard against the cold stone wall. We know better. Kyburn had a razor in his hand, its edge gleaming faintly in the torchlight. He cut away the blue bard's clothing until the man was naked but for his high blue boots. The hair between his legs was brown. Cersei was amused to see. Tell us how you pleasured the little queen, she commanded. I never. I... I sang was all. I sang and played. Her ladies will tell you. They were always with us, her cousins. How many of them did you have carnal knowledge of? None of them. I'm just a singer. Please. Kyburn said, your grace. Mayhaps the poor man only played for Marjorie while she entertained other lovers. No. Please. She never. I sang. I only sang. Lord Kyburn ran a hand up the blue bard's chest. Does she take your nipples in her mouth during your love play? He took one of them between his thumb and forefinger and twisted. Some men enjoy that. Their nipples are as sensitive as a woman's. The razor flashed. The singer shrieked. On his chest, a wet red eye wept blood. Cersei felt ill. Part of her wanted to close her eyes to turn away, to make it stop. But she was the queen and this was treason. Lord Tywin would have not turned away. In the end, the blue bar told them his whole life, back to his first name day. Cersei blamed Marjorie Tyrell for this. If not for her, the Blue Bard might have lived a long and fruitful life, singing his little songs and betting pig girls and crofters' daughters. Her scheming forced this on me. She has soiled me with her treachery. By dawn, the singer's high blue boots were full of blood, and he had told them how Marjorie would fondle herself as she watched her cousins pleasuring him with their mouths. Who were they? The Queen demanded. In the wretched Watt named Sir Talad the Tall, Lambert Turnberry, Alabarzo, the Red Wine Twins, Osney Kettleblack, Hugh Clifton, and her very own brother, the Knight of the Flowers. That displeased Cersei. She dared not besmirch the name of the hero of Dragonstone. 
Besides, no one who knew Sir Loris would ever believe it anyway. The Red Wines could not be a part of it either. Without the Arbor and its fleet, the realm could never hope to rid itself of the Euron Crozai and his accursed Iron Men. All you're doing is spitting up the names of men you saw about her chambers. We want the truth. The truth? The Blue Bard looked at her with one blue eye that Kyburn had left him. Blood bubbled through the holes where his front teeth had been. I might have... misremembered. Horace and Hauber had no part in this, did they? No, he admitted. Not them. As for Sir Loris, I am certain Marjorie took pains to hide what she was doing from her brother. She did. I remember now. Once I had to hide under the bed when Sir Loris came to see her. He must never know, she said. I prefer this song to the other. Leave the great lords out of it. That was for the best. The others, though. Sir Talat had been a hedge knight. Alabarzo was an exile and a beggar. Clifton was the only one of the little queen's guardsmen. Now I know you feel better for having told the truth. You will want to remember that when Marjorie comes to trial. If you were to start lying again. I won't. I'll tell it true. And after? You will be allowed to take the black. You have my word on that. Cersei turned to Kyburn. See that his wounds are cleaned and dressed. And give him milk of the poppy for the pain. Now, even though I felt no connection or interest in Blue Bard, the scene still sickened me because Cersei did this to an innocent man. This is only one example of how evil she can be just to get what she wants. This man will never be the same. Not only was he sliced and diced beyond all recognition, but now he set out to live the rest of his life at the Wall. This really made me hate Cersei even more than I already did. Now, if I'm going to talk about some dark and disturbing scenes, then you know I have to talk about our old friend, Theon Greyjoy. The show did do a really good job at showing what he went through while he was in custody of Ramsay Bolton, but the books are able to go into so much more detail. The next scene I want to show you is when we first find out Theon Greyjoy is now going by the name of Reek. You see, when Ramsay captures Theon in the books, we don't see him again for a very long time. He essentially disappears from the story, so you can only imagine what he's going through during this. When we finally do see him again, he has definitely been transformed into Reek. This is what it says when he finally shows back up in the book. The rat squealed as he bit into it, squirming wildly in his hands, frantic to escape. The belly was the softest part. He tore at the sweet meat, the warm blood running over his lips. It was so good that it brought tears to his eyes. His own belly rumbled as he swallowed. By the third bite, the rat had ceased to struggle, and he was feeling almost content. Then he heard the sound of voices outside the dungeon door. At once he stilled fearing to even chew. His mouth was full of blood and flesh and hair, but he dared not spit or swallow. He was listening in terror, stiff as stone, to the scuff of boots and the clanking of iron keys. No, he thought. No, please, gods. Not now. Not now. It had taken him so long to catch the rat. If they catch me with it, they will take it away. And then they'll tell, and Lord Ramsay will hurt me. He knew that he ought to hide the rat, but he was so hungry. It had been two days since he had eaten, and maybe three. Down here in the dark, it was so hard to tell. Though his arms and legs were thin as reeds, his belly was swollen and hollow, and ached so much that he found he could not sleep. Whenever he closed his eyes, he found himself remembering Lady Hornwood. After their wedding, Lord Ramsay had locked her away in the tower and starved her to death. In the end, she had eaten her own fingers. He crouched down in the corner of his cell, clutching his prize under his chin. Blood ran from the corners of his mouth as he nibbled at the rat with what remained of his teeth, trying to bolt down as much of the warm flesh as he could before the cell was opened. The meat was stringy, but so rich he thought he might be sick. He chewed and swallowed, picking small bones from the holes in his gums where teeth had been yanked out. It hurt to chew, but he was so hungry he could not stop. Now, like most of us fans, I wanted to see Theon suffer for what he did. Not only for betraying Rob and taking Winterfell, but also for burning the farm boys. I wanted to see some justice, but I never wanted it to go this far. If anything, Theon should have died or been burned alive like he did the small boys, but to see this be done to a man for years upon years is unnecessary. After a while, it just becomes sad. Alright, now I want to move on to the next scene I want to show you. This one happens during the night of Ramsay's wedding. In the Game of Thrones television show, they had Ramsay marry Sansa Stark, but that's not what happens in the books. Ramsay does not marry or assault Sansa in the books. He actually does this to her childhood friend, Jane. Now you see, in the books, 
They want everyone to believe that Jane is actually Arya, so it looks as if Ramsay has married into the Stark family. But Theon, of course, would know this is not the real Arya. Since everyone in the North is almost dead, there really isn't anyone who can dispute this, so the Boltons move forward with Ramsay marrying the fake Arya so they can officially claim Winterfell for themselves. So, once Ramsay marries this girl, he takes her upstairs to his bedchamber, just like he did with Sansa in the show. Now let me show you how the scene unfolds in the books. The bedchamber had been well prepared for the consummation. All the furnishings were new, brought up from the borrow town and the baggage train. The canopy bed had a feather mattress and drapes of blood-red velvet. The stone floor was covered with wolfskins. A fire was burning in the hearth, a candle on the bedside table. On the sideboard was a flagon of wine, two cups, and a half a wheel of veined white cheese. There was a chair as well, carved of black oak with a red leather seat. Lord Ramsay was seated in it when they entered. There's my sweet maid. Good lads, you may leave us now. Not you, Reek. You stay. Reek, Reek, it rhymes with peak. He could feel his missing fingers cramping. Two on his left hand, one on his right. And on his hip his dagger rested, sleeping in its leather sheath, but heavy, oh so heavy. It's only my pinky gone on my right hand, Theon reminded himself. I can still grip a knife. My lord, how may I serve you? You gave the wench to me. Who better to unwrap the gift? Let's have a look at Ned Stark's daughter. She is no kin to Lord Eddard, Theon almost said. Ramsay knows. He has to know. What new cruel game is this? The girl was standing by a bedpost, trembling like a doe. Lady Arya, if you will turn your back, I must needs unlace your gown. No. Lord Ramsay poured himself a cup of wine. Laces take too long. Cut it off her. Theon drew the dagger. All I need to do is turn and stab him. The knife is in my hand. He knew the game by then. Another trap, he told himself, remembering Kira with her keys. He wants me to try to kill him. When I fail, he'll flay the skin from the hand I used to hold the blade. He grabbed a handful of the bride's skirt. Stand still, my lady. The gown was loose below the waist, so that was where he slid the blade in, slicing slowly, so as not to cut her. The steel whispered through wool and silk with a faint, soft sound. The girl was shaking. Theon had to grab her arm to hold her still. Jane, Jane, it rhymes with pain. He tightened his grip, as much as his maimed left hand would allow. Finally, the gown fell away, a pale tangle around her feet. Her small clothes too, Ramsay commanded. Reek obeyed. When it was done, the bride stood naked, her bridal finery a heap of white and gray rags about her feet. Her breasts were small and pointed, her hips narrow and girlish, her legs as skinny as a bird's. A child. Theon had forgotten how young she was. Sansa's age. Arya would be even younger. Now, despite the fire in the hearth, the bedchamber was chilly. Jane's skin was covered by goose prickles. There was a moment when her hands rose, as if to cover her breasts. But Theon mouthed a silent no, and she saw and stopped at once. What do you think of her, Reek? Asked Lord Ramsay. She... What answer does he want? What was it the girl had said before the gods would? They all said that I was pretty. She was not pretty now. He could see a spiderweb of faint, thin lines across her back where someone had whipped her. She is beautiful, so, so beautiful. Ramsay smiled his wet smile. Does she make your handcock hard reek? Is it straining against your laces? Would you like to sleep with her first? He laughed. The Prince of Winterfell should have that right, as all lords did in the days of old. The first night. But you're no lord, are you? Only reek. Not even a man, truth be told. He then took another gulp of wine, then threw the cup across the room to shatter off a wall. Red rivers ran down across the stone. Lady Arya, get on the bed. Yes, against the pillows. That's a good wife. Now spread your legs. Let us see what you have down there. The girl obeyed, wordless. Theon took a step back to the door. Lord Ramsay sat beside his bride, slid his hand along her inner thigh, then jammed two fingers up inside her. The girl let out a gasp of pain. You're dry as an old bone. Ramsay pulled his hand free, then slapped her across the face. I was told that you'd know how to please a man. Was that a lie? N no, my lord. I was t, -t trained Ramsay rose, the firelight shining on his face. Reek, get over here. Get her ready for me. For a moment, he did not understand. I... Do you mean... My lord, I have no... I... With your mouth, Lord Ramsay said, and be quick about it. 
If she's not wet by the time I'm done disrobing, I will cut off that tongue of yours and nail it to the wall. Somewhere in the god's wood, a raven screamed. The dagger was still in his hand. He sheathed it. Reek. My name is Reek. It rhymes with weak. Then, Reek bent to his task. I don't think I need to go into any more details than this. Obviously, this was a very sick and disgusting scene. However, if their wedding night wasn't bad enough, things would only get worse from here on out. Ramsay would keep her locked up in the tower, where she would be heard crying every night. She had been through so much, she did not believe Theon when he eventually told her he wanted to help her escape. When Theon does explain to her how they can escape, we find out even more disturbing details about what Ramsay has done to her. This is what it said. Jane lifted her wolfskins up to her chin. No, this is some trick. It's him. It's my... my lord. My sweet lord. He sent you. This is just some test to make sure that I love him. I do. I do. I love him more than anything. A single tear ran down her cheek. Tell him. You tell him. I'll do what he wants. Whatever he wants. With him or... or with the dog or... He doesn't need to cut off my feet. I won't try to run away. Not ever. I'll give him sons, I swear it. I swear it. So as you can see, not only has Ramsay forced her to do things with him or Reek, but this also insinuates he's had her do things with the dogs as well. It's just another example of how screwed up Ramsay really is. He is easily one of the worst characters in all of A Song of Ice and Fire. Jane was only a sweet summer child, with a head full of stories and songs, who unfortunately lost her father, her only friend, her virtue, her innocence, and her sanity as well. At the very least, I would like to see Ramsay suffer the same fate in the books as he did in the show. But if it were up to me, I would have him suffer even more. Now it was very satisfying to see Ramsay's own dogs eat him alive, but it still ended too fast. Since he has made so many characters suffer, he deserves that much and then some. Anyways, these are only a handful of scenes from the books that are very dark, but believe me, there are so many more. Let me know what scenes really had an effect on you, especially if there are ones I haven't mentioned here. I would love to hear them. I want to thank everyone for stopping by to watch the video. It really means a lot to me, and I hope all of you have a great day. I will see you again very soon. Bye.